In this video, we'll go over several different problems where we'll review fundamental concepts from Calculus 1 and 2. This is not meant to be a comprehensive review, but rather to just skip the highlights and some of the basic things that we'll need to remember from those courses before we get started with Calculus 3. So first we're going to talk about exponents and logs. And in this one, we're, going, we're asked to evaluate the expression the natural log of e to the 20th power. Now, what we're being asked to remember here is that the logarithm and exponential functions are inverse operations. So that when we have the natural log of e to a power, natural log of e to the x, is just equal to x. So that means that the natural log of e to the 20 is just equal to 20. Similarly, in this problem, we have e to the natural log of 6. And again, what we're being asked to remember here is that whenever we have e to the natural log of x, that is again just x. So in this case, e to the natural log of 6 is just 6. In these next few problems, we're being asked to remember some of the logarithmic properties. So in this case, we're being told that uh, we're going to use a to stand for natural log of 2 and b to stand for natural log of 3, and we want to rewrite each expression in terms of a and b. So for the first one, we've got natural log of 6, and so what we're thinking about is that 6 is equal to 2 times 3. And one of our log rules is that if I take the log of a product, that's really the sum of the logarithms. So that's natural log of 2 plus natural log of 3. And then in this problem, natural log of 2 is what we're calling a, and natural log of 3 is what we're calling b. So this one would write as a plus b. Next up, we've got natural log of 18. So remember, we're trying to break this number 18 up into 2s and 3s. So 18 is 2 times 3 times 3, or in other words, 2 times 3 squared. So natural log of a product is the sum of the logs. That's So we get natural log of 2 plus natural log of 3 squared. And now we're using a rule that says that when we have the log of a product, sorry, the log of a power, so in this case we've got 3 squared, so the rule says that we can bring that power down, and we can write that as 2 times the natural log of 3. So again, natural log of 2 is what we're calling a, natural log of 3 is what we're calling b, so in this case we're calling this a plus 2b. This time we've got the natural log of a fraction, so natural log of 4 thirds, the rule here is that the natural log of a fraction is the difference between the natural log of the top minus the natural log of the bottom. Again, we can write 4 as 2 squared, and then we can bring that power down and write this as 2 times the natural log of 2 minus the natural log of 3, so that's 2a minus b. Finally, we've got natural log of 1 twelfth. We could do this one like we did the previous one, where we write it as the natural log of 1 minus the natural log of 12. But here I'm going to do it slightly differently, and write this as 12 to the minus 1, and bring down that power, so I have negative 1 times the natural log of 12. Now 12 I'm going to write as 2 times 2 times 3, and then I can break that up into the natural log of 2 times 2 plus the natural log of 3, so that's the natural log of 2 plus the natural log of 2, plus the natural log of 3. So that's a plus a plus b. That's 2a plus b. And then when I distribute that negative 1, I get negative 2a minus b. So I did that one slightly differently, but again, using some of the different log rules, we can rewrite these. So we're never going to see specific problems like this, but we may need to remember those log rules in various different situations. So this is just a good type of exercise that helps us remember those log rules. Next up, we're going to need to remember some facts about trigonometric functions. So there are some special angles that commonly show up that are good to remember in terms of finding sines, cosines, and tangents. And those are uh, related to 30, 60, 90 degree triangles and 45, 45, 90 triangles. So let's just draw those real quick. So here's a right triangle where this angle is 30 degrees, this angle is 60 degrees, and if I label the sides here, this side is length 1 half, this side is length square root of 3 over 2, and that side is length 1. And again, if we convert these to radians, 30 degrees is pi over 6, 60 degrees is pi over 3. And then the 45, 45, 90 right triangle looks like this. 
That's an isosceles right triangle because it's got two equal angles. And the sides here are square root of 2 over 2, square root of 2 over 2 over 1. And again, converting to radians, that's pi over 4. That's also pi over 4. So in this case, if I want to know the sine of pi over 3, something we can remember is soka toa. So the sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So in this case, in my 30, 60, 90 degree right triangle, uh, from the pi over 3 angle, the opposite is square root of 3 over 2, and the hypotenuse is 1. So this is going to be the square root of 3 over 2 over 1, which is just the square root of 3 over 2. Similarly, referring back to those triangles, if I take the cosine of pi over 4, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and so looking at that 45, 45, 90 right triangle, that's going to be square root of 2 over 2. Tangent is opposite over adjacent, so again, if I look at my 30, 60, 90 degree right triangle, tangent of pi over 6 is going to be opposite over adjacent. The opposite is going to be... For this problem, we're looking at an inverse trigonometric function. So the first thing we have to remember is that when we see sine to the minus 1 there, that does not mean 1 over sine. So this does not mean 1 over the sine of 1 half. Right? It means the inverse sine of 1, of 1 half. So this is an angle whose sine is 1 half. And so what we're doing is we're thinking about the various different, uh, our knowledge of trigonometric functions of angles and trying to think of an angle that when we take the sine of that angle, we get one half. And so in our thought process, we're thinking to ourselves, well, I know that if I take the sine of pi over 6, the sine of 30 degrees, that's one half. So that means that the inverse sine of one half is pi over 6. So that's how that works. Similarly, for this one, this is the inverse cosine of negative 1. So this is an angle whose cosine is minus 1. Now, when we're getting trigonometric functions that are giving us negative results, it might be a little bit easier to think about those on the unit circle. So here's my standard unit circle. And if I remember, when we have an angle... Uh, the cosine of that angle is indicated by the x-coordinate of that point. So if the x-coordinate is negative 1, we're thinking about this point over here, which is negative 1, comma 0. So which angle corresponds to that point? Well, there are multiple answers to that question. So for example, one answer is pi, but another answer is 3 pi. Another answer is negative pi, which would go that way. So there's lots of different ways. So in fact, any odd multiple of pi has a cosine of negative 1. So which angle are we talking about? Cosine of pi is negative 1. Cosine of 3 pi is negative 1. Cosine of 5 pi is negative 1. Cosine of negative pi is negative 1, etc. So which angle is it? Well, it turns out that the definition of inverse cosine is a little bit more specific than I've given here. Not only is the inverse cosine an angle whose cosine is negative 1, it's an angle between 0 and pi, whose cosine is negative 1. So in this case, the only one of those angles that I found that actually fits that bill is this first one, cosine of pi equaling negative 1. So that means that the inverse cosine of negative 1 is pi. Incidentally, the rule for inverse sine is similar. So the inverse sine of A is an angle, an angle, between, slightly different for inverse sine, between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, whose sine is so for inverse cosine, the angle has to be between 0 and pi. For inverse sine, the angle has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. 
for inverse tangent, the angle has to be between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2 again. So inverse cosine is the only one that's a little bit of an oddball. So this is an angle between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2, whose tangent is 1. And again, if we rack our brain and think about the various different angles that we know about, we know that pi over 4, also known as 45 degrees, works. So the tangent of pi over 4 is 1, and pi over 4 is between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. 45 degrees is between negative 90 and 90. So those two facts together would tell us that the inverse tan of 1 is pi over 4. So inverse trig functions can be tricky to work with, but they do come up fairly uh, infrequently. But when they do come up, we need to understand how they work. Okay, moving on to derivatives. Obviously, we spent a lot of time talking about derivatives in Calc 1, so let's try to remember some of those derivative rules. So the first derivative rule we need to remember is the power rule, which says that the derivative of x to the nth power is n times x to the n minus 1. So when we see that x to the fourth there, the derivative of x to the fourth is going to be 4 times x to the 4 minus 1, or in other words, 4 times x cubed. Other rules that we're going to be using here are the constant multiple rule, which says that we have a constant times a function, and we take the derivative, that's the constant times the derivative, the constant just sticks around while we take the derivative of the thing it's being multiplied by. But if we have a constant all by itself, the derivative of a constant is zero. And we also have a sum and difference rule, which says that if we have two functions added or subtracted together, then the derivative there is the sum or difference of the two derivatives. So all of those rules together tell me that my derivative here can be broken up. So the derivative of 3x to the fourth is going to be 3 times the derivative of x to the fourth, minus the derivative of 9x is 9 times the derivative of x, and the derivative of x is 1, and the derivative of 10 is 0. So 3 times 4x cubed, that's going to be 12x cubed minus 9, and so that's my derivative. For this example, we have a composed function, or sometimes called a compound function. We've got a function inside a function. We've got 4x plus 7, and that's all being raised to the sixth power. For this, we need the chain rule. And the chain rule says that if you want to take the derivative of f of g of x, a function inside a function, then the chain rule says you take the derivative of the outside function, leaving the inside function alone, and then you multiply by the derivative of that inside function. So in this case, the inside function is 4x plus 7, and I can think of that as being condensed down into a single letter, which I'm usually called u, and so the derivative of this function is going to be the derivative of u to the 6th, which is 6 times u to the 5th. I leave the inside function alone, so this part here is really 6u to the 5th, again, my thought process, but then I have to multiply by the derivative of that inside function. The derivative of 4x plus 7 is 4. So that 4 is coming from the derivative of u, which was 4x plus 7. So that's how my chain rule works here in this case. For this example, we have a product. And so for this one, we need the product rule. The product rule tells me that the derivative of f of x times g of x is the derivative of the first function times the second function, minus the first function, times the derivative of the second function. In this case, my two functions are x and cosine of 2x. So my derivative is the derivative of the first function, which is 1, times the second function, plus the first function, which is x, times the derivative of the second function. So what's the derivative of the cosine of 2x? Well, for that, we have to remember what the derivative of cosine is, and we have six different trig functions, so we have to know all six derivatives, but I'll just remind you of this one, which is that the derivative of cosine is minus sine. So using my chain rule, the derivative of the cosine of 2x is minus the sine of 2x, but then I have to multiply by 2 because 2 is the derivative of 2x. So again, I'm using the chain rule there to find the derivative of the cosine of 2x. 
And we could simplify that, but that's our result. For this one, we've got the inverse tangent of x squared. Just like the trig functions have different derivatives, the inverse trig functions have derivatives. I'll just in remind you of the derivative of inverse tan of x, which is 1 over 1 plus x squared. So again, using the chain rule, the derivative of inverse tan of x squared is going to be 1 plus 1, 1 over 1 plus x squared squared. But then I have to multiply by the derivative of that inside function, which in this case is 2x. So again, using the chain rule, together with my derivative formula for inverse tangent. All right, so just like we talked about derivatives, now we're going to talk about integrals. We spent a lot of time talking about those in Calc 1 and Calc 2 as well. So just like we have constant multiple rules and some indifferent rules for derivatives that help us break derivative problems down into simpler problems, we have those similar same rules for integrals. We have constant multiple rules, some indifferent rules. And then we use those together with individual rules for each different type of function. So the power rule for integrals tells us that the integral of something that looks like x to the n is going to be 1 divided by n plus 1 times x to the n plus 1. When we take an indefinite integral, that's an integral that doesn't have the little numbers on it where we plug in and subtract. So an indefinite integral, we always have to have a plus c at the end. And note that this rule does not work if n is equal to negative 1, because if n equals negative 1, that would cause us to divide by 0. What do we do if n is equal to negative 1? Well, that's the integral of x to the minus 1, which is the same as 1 over x, and that's the natural log of x plus c. So in this case, we don't have anything that has x to the minus 1 in it, but it's just good to know that just for our own sake. So breaking this down, we get 3 times the antiderivative of x to the 4th, which is 1 fifth x to the 5th. 9 times the antiderivative of x, we can think of x as x to the first power, so that's going to give us 1 half x squared. 10, the antiderivative of 10 is 10x. Again, that's another antiderivative rule here. The antiderivative of constant is a constant times x. And then we took an antiderivative, so we have a plus c at the end. So that's our antiderivative. Once we got beyond simple antiderivatives in Calc 1, we learned about the substitution rule. In this case, I'm giving you the hint to use the substitution rule u equals 4x plus 7. So remember that what we do in that case is we also need to know what our du is. In this case, du is the derivative of 4x plus 7, which is 4 times dx. And so what that tells us is that in our integral, right here next to the dx, we really want to have a 4 there. So we want there to be a 4 there next to the dx. And if you remember, the trick that we used to get that is since 4 is a constant, we multiply by 4 on the inside of the integral, and we divide by 4 on the outside of the integral. Then we convert this into an integral in terms of the variable u. u is 4x plus 7, so that's u to the 6th. 4 dx is du, so now we have a much simpler looking integral, which is u to the 6th du. We take our antiderivative, that's 1 7th u to the 7th plus c. Now we put back in our original variable, 1 4th times 1 7th is 1 28th. u was 4x plus 7. And so there is, again, our antiderivative. Another integration technique that we learned in Calc 2 was integration by parts. The formula for integration by parts is that the integral of u dv is equal to u v minus the integral of v du. So in this case, we're looking for a way to break our integral up x times the cosine of 2x, we want to break that up into uh, a u times a dv. And we want to do so in such a way where the u is something that's easy to take the derivative of, and the dv is something that's not too hard to take the antiderivative of. So in this case, I'm going to let u equal x and dv equal the cosine of 2x dx. The derivative of x is 1 dx. And then the antiderivative of cosine of 2x, that's not super easy, but we can do a quick little substitution of u equals 2x, and we can, without hopefully too much trouble, figure out that the antiderivative there is going to be 1 half times the sine of 2x. So that may require a little bit of extra work on your part to go off on the side and figure that out, but once we get good at substitution, simple substitutions like that usually don't give us too much trouble. So using integration by parts, we get uv, so x times 1 half times the sine of 2x, minus the integral of v du, so that's 1 half sine 2x, and then du here is just dx. 
So this is one half sine, sorry, one half x sine two x. And then here, again, we do a quick little substitution, a u equals two x substitution, which is gonna give us that this is now minus one fourth. So that minus turns that minus into a plus cosine of two x plus c. And that's our final answer. So again, I'm skimming over a couple of those quick substitutions here, but again, we've all passed to Calc 1 and Calc 2 at this point, so hopefully those are things that, uh, if you're not too familiar with, you can get yourself back up to speed pretty quickly. Finally, another technique in integration that will come up every once in a while for us is trigonometric integrals. So in this case, we have powers of sine times powers of cosine, and again, you just have to kind of remember what it is that you have to do here. So the key is that we had to look at these powers, the power on the sine and the power on the cosine. We have a three and we have a two. And since the three is odd, that means that we can do this in a, a easier way. The, it gets really tricky when both powers are even, and I won't get into that into this video, but um, when we do have an odd power, it's not so bad. So what we wanna do is break this integral up where we take one of those powers of sine. So we take sine of x, and then we have still sine squared because we had three copies of sine. So we split off one of those copies of sine. So we have sine squared and cosine squared. And then what we wanna do is move that one copy of sine that we split off, and we wanna shift it over so that it's over there next to the dx. And I like to think of this sine x dx, that's gonna be my du, or it's going to be related to my du. So that's reserved, I don't wanna to touch that. But now I want to use my trig identities, and specifically here I want to use my uh, Pythagorean identity, sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, to rewrite everything else in my integral in terms of the other trig function. Since my du is going to be related to sine, I want everything else to be in terms of cosine. And so that means that I'm going to replace sine squared with 1 minus cosine squared. So in my integral, I have 1 minus cosine squared, times cosine squared, and then I've got sine x dx. So the substitution I'm going to want to use is going to be u equals cosine x. So my du, the derivative of cosine, is negative sine. And so it's not going to work out quite perfectly because I really want there to be a negative sine in there. But I can multiply by a negative 1 there as long as I divide by negative 1 out front. Dividing by negative 1 is the same as multiplying by negative 1. So that means that I have negative 1 1 minus u squared times u squared du. Multiplying and distributing the negative 1, I get u to the fourth minus u squared du. That's an easy integral. We got 1 fifth u to the fifth minus 1 third u to the third plus c. And then finally we put back in what u was. u was cosine of x. So that's 1 fifth cosine to the fifth of x minus 1 third cosine cubed of x plus c. And that is our result. So again, I'm not assuming that I'm teaching you all this stuff in this video. Obviously, I've gone through a lot of these problems very quickly. But hopefully this reminds you of some of the stuff that you've seen before. If you need further review of anything in this video seems like, oh my gosh, I don't remember doing that at all, or I took Calc 2 a couple of years ago and it's been a really long time and I don't remember a lot of this stuff, please reach out to me individually and I can provide you with some more resources and some more examples uh, to help get you up to speed. But hopefully this all seemed familiar and all seemed like a, a good review of some of the things that you've learned over the last couple of semesters.